What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode. It has been a hot minute. It's been a hot second. Whatever your terminology is, whatever the cool kids lingo is these days, it's been that long. How are you doing? I feel a million, literally one six zeros better than I did last Monday morning. Holy smokes. And to address that really quickly, because I know there's going to be um, questions, comments, concerns. Thank you for the overwhelming support of this illness that I had. It was the absolute worst thing I think I've experienced in a long, long time. I had a killer, an absolute killer of a sore throat. Are you good, bro? I'm trying to do, trying to do something. It's my dog Bogey jumping on the um, little bench we have in the office. Anyways, I had a killer, absolute killer of a sore throat that I experienced and had on, hmm, when did I first got it? I think it was before the NFL draft live stream that I had it. And I think I muscled through that. Or maybe it was just kind of like the early stages of a sore throat. And then like Friday morning, it was really, really bad. I still went to drill all that over the weekend for the military, you know, kept my distance and all that good stuff from people. So I didn't, you know, you know, give the sore throat, whatever I had to them. Everyone was good and fine. I come back, you know, it's Monday morning and I'm like, I don't know if I can do this. And for someone who sits behind a microphone creating podcast episodes or YouTube videos, whatever it is, the importance of a good throat and a good voice is super important. And it's kind of slept on in a lot of media platforms because, you know, you look at announcers, commentators, sport, like, you know, radio people, they all rely on their voice and their throat. You know, a lot of them, you know, have throat lozenges. A lot of them will have tea, taking you know, some medicine. I tried all of that. I tried all of that over the weekend and just nothing was really working for me so you know what I was like let me just call it let me just call the episodes for the week because I don't want to kind of feel good Wednesday push through an episode on Wednesday and it sound like absolute ass like this one might sound like ass I don't really know I feel 95% healthy my voice does at least you know there's still a little little bit of a, a zing there but that's more of like kind of just phlegm I, I have no idea what the hell is going on, but you know what? I'm back and I'm better, a million times better like I was uh, last week, and I just didn't want to force any episodes out. I didn't want to strain my throat and my voice all too much. Like I said, I didn't want to sound like ass. I didn't want the quality of the episode of that podcast, that podcast episode to be terrible, and I was just like, you know what? Let me give my body, my voice, and my throat some time because it's clearly telling me something. And I don't want to ignore it. So <clears throat> I appreciate everybody for just really being um, generous, really being appreciative and supportive of my you know, little sickness, my sore throat, whatever we want to call it. I was still able to make some YouTube videos as the quality on those was significantly, uh, <laughs> significantly bad compared to, you know, hopefully what this is sounding like. Or what other videos and other podcast episodes sound like. But, you know, those are nice, short, sweet, simple, a lot easier to do than sit behind a microphone for like an hour and talk to you about sports. Where with the YouTube videos, I'm able to stop, pause, you know, edit a little bit more frequently than I am here as I try to do this in as less cuts as possible. So I really feel like, you know, doing the YouTube videos were really good test. For my voice as it got better and better on Thursday and on Friday over the weekend. But I really wanted to wait until Monday to really push back through with the uh, the podcast episodes. Because these are longer versions of you know content. And it's a lot easier to do just simple YouTube videos than it is to do a you know, 40, 45 hour long podcast episode. So I like I said, I just wanted to make sure that my voice, my throat... We're all good and chipper before I actually start redoing the episodes again for Murph Boston Sports Talk. 
So again, 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 I have to be appreciative of not you just downloading, listening, and enjoying like I always preach and I always scream about. But thank you so much for really, you know, holding it down for me, being appreciative, being supportive. While I had this sore throat over the past week plus, I am back. And like I said, I am better, a million times better. And I can't wait to deliver the sports content that I promised that I would when I first started this podcast. So with all of that out of the way, with all of that out, oh, Bogey's looking so cute. He just found his little comfy spot on the bench and he's sleeping on a baseball pillow. Oh, he looks so adorable. So with all that out of the way, I know there's a lot of stuff from the weekend, last weekend, from Monday all the way through last weekend into this weekend. There's a ton of sports stuff to talk about, a bunch of different topics. And instead of rehashing on some older topics that may have been either touched upon on other social media platforms, other podcasts, other news, you know, platforms, whatever it may be. I'm just going to kind of talk about the highlights that I have of each of the four main sports. So obviously football is the draft, you know, basketball, we'll, we'll get into it, right? We'll get into it as we get there. But since I talked about the Patriots in the draft, obviously, if you tuned into my live stream on draft night last Thursday, I appreciate you being there. You know, if you commented, I greatly appreciate that. I love everyone for entering into the giveaway, the Amazon gift card giveaway. I promise you it was not rigged. My brother Donnie did win. I promise you, I promise you, I promise you it was not rigged. And it was awesome. The whole live stream was awesome. It was an absolute blast to do. I had so much fun. Kim had a lot of fun. It was just a great overall great experience to actually go live stream on some form of you know social media that I haven't done before because you know the podcast and the YouTube videos they're all pre-recorded edited stuff and this you know YouTube live was just raw me you hey you see me I can't see you but you can see me and it's all in real time so yeah yeah and it was awesome it was super fun I had a great I had a great time. I can't, you know, stress more about it. I'm so happy and thankful for everyone that was able to tune in, like the live stream, comment about it, you know, the new subscribers that were there. It was just a great overall fun time. And honestly, it went a lot better than I thought it was going to. I had very low expectations, a little nervous myself, but you know what? Once the draft got underway and people were tuning in, it was fantastico, fantastico. So anyways, I know I'm kind of digressing here. But the Patriots, let's talk about them really quickly. And obviously the draft, they drafted Mac Jones with the first, um, their first round pick, 15th overall. They felt, uh, Mac Jones fell to the Patriots. Fell. Now, a lot of people had Mac Jones going to San Francisco at number three, and they did not. They took Trey Lance. And I was a firm believer that if Mac Jones was going to go number three, then the Patriots were going to have to trade up. And I really think the Patriots should have traded up anyways. I think they should have went after Justin Fields. And Justin Fields ended up getting taken by the Bears at 11, where the Bears trade up to get him at 11. But it's like, is Mac Jones the guy? You know, a lot of people are high on Mac Jones. A lot of people are low on Mac Jones. There's really no in-between with Mac Jones the quarterback out of Alabama. Now, me, the very beginning, if you trace back all of the podcast episodes, I couldn't even tell you when I first started talking about this. I predicted and wanted Mac Jones to go to the Patriots at 15. I said that because I thought he'd be a good fit. He gives you a lot of Brady-like attributes from a quarterback. Smart, accurate, not going to make dumb decisions. He, He can learn the playbook. He can implement the playbook. And he's not going to go out there and try to play hero ball, meaning he's not going to make it a one-man show, right? He's going to be a team guy. He's going to do what's best for the team, and that's it. Obviously, over time, he's going to become, hopefully, obviously, you know, we hope that he's going to become, you know, a star quarterback in this league where maybe Justin Fields or Trey Lance doesn't, and you're like, okay, you know what? Taking Mac Jones was the right thing. Mac Jones is 
claimed to be the most sure ready quarterback out of the five. You could probably argue against Trevor Lawrence, which, you know, I would concede to that argument because I think Trevor Lawrence is very NFL ready. Obviously, we're going to see him in that Jack- Jacksonville Jaguars offense. We will see if that's true or not. But when you look at Zach Wilson, who the Patriots were never going to get, I think, that, you know, the Jets are just taking the best prospect available for their biggest need being quarterback, obviously. And there was never a doubt. There was never a doubt that Zach Wilson or Trevor Lawrence were going to be there for you late in that first, late in the top 10, right? So it was always a conversation between Justin Fields, Mac Jones, and Trey Lance. There was a lot of rumors, a lot of reports that the Patriots could trade up to 7, to 8, to 10, to 12 even to go get a quarterback. I wanted them to trade up to 7 to take Justin Fields. They obviously did not. I wanted them to make that move to move up to secure their guy. Now, if Mac Jones was their guy and they didn't have to move up, then, hey, that's an A-plus move, Billy. Billy B, that's an A-plus move. Because a lot of people were saying, trade up, trade up, trade up, trade up to number four, trade up to number seven, trade up to number ten, get your guy. You didn't have to. Now, you're lucky that the draft played out the way that it did because... You see Chicago trading up nine spots to sneak in to get Justin Fields at 11. There was rumors and reports that New Orleans Saints, all the way at 28, wanted to trade up and get into this quarterback field because is Jameis Winston their guy? Who knows? But they can draft someone that could potentially be the future if Jameis Winston is not their guy. So is Mac Jones falling to you at 15 where he should have gone or is it just where he happened to go? And I want to believe that he happened to fall there because teams didn't need a quarterback outside of the Jaguars, the Jets, and the 49ers. Outside of those three teams, I don't think anyone else really needed a quarterback. And you can argue that the Bears don't need a quarterback, but drafting Justin Fields gives them a future, gives them hope for years to come because Andy Dalton is obviously not their guy. He may be their guy this year, but that's just about it. So I get them wanting to trade up. But there could have been another team that traded up as well and took Mac Jones if they seemed it was a good fit. Like I said, New Orleans potentially could have moved up and snagged Mac Jones, who is, you know, a comparable player to Drew Brees, just as much as he is comparable to Tom Brady. I just wanted the Patriots to move up in the draft so they didn't lose out on their guy. They They were able to be guaranteed a quarterback. You trade up to seven. At the time, you were guaranteed Justin Fields or Mac Jones, whoever your guy is. You know, there's a lot of rumors about the Patriots trading up to 10 with the Cowboys. You go up at the time, Fields and Jones were still on the board. You go up and you get your guy. I just think Mac Jones falling to you wasn't, you know, necessarily him not being a top flight prospect or, you know, people think he's going to be a good quarterback. I just don't think teams needed a quarterback like that. And for him to fall to you at 15, people are saying it's the steal of the draft. People are saying that, you know, he fell in the draft. Some people are saying that that's where he should belong. At the end of the day, I don't care. The Patriots got, hopefully, their guy. And when I mention their guy, I say that with so much emphasis. Because last year, last year, we were in this predicament. Who's going to be the quarterback? At the time of the draft last year, we did not have Cam Newton. Our only active quarterbacks were Brian Hoyer and Jared Stidham. Obviously, Brian Hoyer is not the future of this team, but at the time, people were trying to say that Jared Stidham was, and that he could be. He is the heir to Tom Brady. This is Jared Stidham's team. Brian Hoyer will kind of tutor him along. Jordan Love, someone that I'm very big on, and he obviously with his Aaron Rodgers news coming out, he could see you know some playing time sooner than later. Who knows? But when it was time for the Patriots to draft in the first round last year, they traded out. I was heated. I was so pissed. Anyways, Jordan Love gets drafted by the Packers, and the Patriots don't draft a single quarterback that entire draft. And I said, I am only okay with this decision, and I'm fine with that if Jarrett Stidham is your guy. One year later, we can absolutely all agree that Jarrett Stidham is not the guy. He is not the future of this team. He is not Tom Brady's replacement. He will not be the quarterback of this team for the next 10 years. However, you now drafted a quarterback in the first round 
and Tom, I mean, I'm not Tom Brady, I'm sorry, Mac Jones is, you know, giving us hope that he is the quarterback for the next 10 years. And obviously, if we're using a first round pick on him, hopefully he is. And hopefully he does it very, very well. Other than Mac Jones drafting the, um, being drafted by the Patriots, I really like the draft for the Patriots. I wish they got a wide receiver sooner than the seventh round. Trey uh, Nixon, I believe his name is, wide receiver. I would really like to have seen the Patriots get one sooner in the draft. I know you just just signed Kendrick Bourne, Nelson Aguilar. You still have Nikhil Harry, but with Julian Edelman kind of with Julian Edelman retiring, Nikhil Harry is still a question mark. Yes, you have Jacoby Myers. I just feel like you know getting someone in the third, maybe the fourth round would have been a little more ideal, just to give you a little bit of better of a talented prospect than someone in the seventh round. But you know what? I'm not going to complain about it. I'm not going to bitch here about it. I think the draft overall was very well. You addressed issues, quarterback, uh, you know, defensive tackle, obviously trading up to get Christian Barmore from Alabama. You drafted a cornerback. You drafted a running back. You did address the wide receiver, although it was later in the draft. So I really feel like that you were able to address your needs this draft. And I think every single need was addressed. So great draft. Obviously, we'll see how these prospects and these new Patriot players turn out over the next couple of months and hopefully over the next couple of years. Now, I want I want to talk about the Celtics and yes, they lost a miserable game to the Chicago Bulls. I'm not going to talk about it. I'm not going to talk about it because do we really need me to hash and rash the Celtics yet again? Just a couple of weeks ago, I was trying to convince myself and I was telling you folks that this team could be taken seriously, that it seems like this team figured it out. Well, we were goofed. We were fooled, and we were straight up lied to. Now, Evan Fournier is back. He's playing very well, it seems like. Kemba is playing, excuse me, playing very well. But you lose a massive piece with Jalen Brown getting injured. He's been injured in and out of the line the past couple of days. He was just ruled out literally 10 minutes before I started recording. He was just ruled out for the rest of the season with a torn ligament in his wrist. Now, me, I tore my wrist when I was a, at the end of my senior year of high school. It's not fun. It's very discomforting. You can still kind of play and still do your, uh, you know, your own thing. But boy, does it hurt like crazy. You know, when you get the adrenaline, the juice is flowing, the you know, pain kind of goes away. And obviously you can take some medicine and such. But you know what? In a season that's so up in the air, his you know first year of his new contract, just shut him down. If this team goes off and does something, so be it. But we all know, we all know that it wasn't the Celtics' year. I mean, there's just no way. There's no way that this team was going to beat the Milwaukee Bucks, the Brooklyn Nets, the... Um, why can't I think of them? Why can't I think? Oh, the Philadelphia 76ers. Uh, you see the Miami Heat. They just got torched by the Miami Heat today. T uh, yeah, today. Today? Or yesterday. Hold on. What was it today or yesterday? No, it was yesterday. Right? Bogey, was it today or yesterday? It was yesterday. Okay, yeah. I'm sorry, guys. It was yesterday. They got you know torched by the Heat yesterday. They did, they did come back and make it a game. But come on. And then like the day before that or a couple days before that, they got torched by the Bulls. Not going to talk about it. And then, obviously, I can't forget about the uh, the New York Knicks here. Playing absolutely fantastic over the past month and a half or so. Absolutely took the East by storm as being a potential lottery team at the beginning of the year. To a fringe playoff team. To what it seems like a now contender in the Eastern Conference. You should be that contender in the Eastern Conference. Not the New York Knicks. And nothing against the New York Knicks. I really like their young players and pieces. Julius Randle is really starting to play like the player that he was supposed to be back when he was drafted seven years ago, I believe, in the 2014 draft. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong on that. Derrick Rose has a, has had a resurgence in his career. Absolutely un, like, you know, unremarkable what he's doing. You know, A lot of people casted him off as just you know a role player, but now he's starting to play like the superstar that he once was in Chicago before he tore in uh, his ACL and meniscus. And here are the Celtics, where you have a superstar upcomer in Jason Tatum, a all-star stud 
maybe superstar. You know, the way he was playing this year, absolutely. And Jalen Brown, Kemba Walker, who is that locker room leader guy who really, you know, is the glue to everything, who can drop 30, has some nasty ankle-breaking step backs. And Kemba Walker, Evan Fournier, who can, you know, score 20 points per game. You get him from Orlando at the deadline, someone that's going to really help solidify your scoring. A absolute tenacious dog defender, and I say that in a good way, Marcus Smart, Rob Williams, the Time Lord. You know, you have all these pieces on your team, and you can't do anything about it in the Eastern Conference except be a potential playoff team for the longest time. Then you sneak up back into the middle of the pack, and now you're on the verge of being a, a play-in team. It's absolutely, it's absolutely mind-boggling. It's blasphemous, and it's disgusting. This team is so much better than what we're seeing from them, and losing Jalen Brown is a tough blow. It really is. But this team should still be able to perform very well without him. Now, will they be able to make a deep playoff run with him uh, without him? No. Could they have with him? potentially but I don't know and I'm not saying Jalen Brown's the problem because he's not it's just the rest of the team this team has no zero absolutely no veteran leadership you look at the Clippers they went out and traded for Rajon Rondo and the Clippers are playing absolutely fantastic with him he doesn't have to score the ball all the time but he can be a facilitator a glue to that team to lead um Paul George to lead Kawhi Leonard although you know Kawhi Leonard's a very good leader himself with his playoff experience, but still having that presence in your locker room in Rondo it helps. Rondo is a proven bona fide, you know, winner. He wherever he goes, he helps win. Celtics win, even though you could say he wasn't really the cause for that, right? The Lakers, he won. Also couldn't say he was the cause of that. He went to the Bulls. Bulls were up on the Celtics a few years ago in the playoffs in the first round, 2-0. And then he, I think he tore his wrist himself, ironically enough. And then the next thing you know, the Celtics backsweep the Bulls that year. Well, he was winning on the Bulls until he got injured. Rajon Rondo helps deliver winners. I don't want to say winners, but he helps to deliver winning pedigree, right? The New York Knicks, they go out and trade for Derrick Rose to bring him back to New York. Look what he's done. Since he's gotten back to New York. They're only winning. But, and then you trade Daniel Tice to get under the uh, the luxury tax. And you get Mo Watt, Wagner and Luke Cornett. And they're doing nothing. Mo Wagner's not even on your damn team no more. And Cornett gets like, you know, eight minutes a game, whatever. And he puts up two points. So you got virtually nothing for Daniel Tice. Who's actually contributing to the team. Time Lord Rob Williams has been in and out of the lineup for injury. Tristan Thompson has now been a little injured. He's been in and out of the lineup. So your big man is literally Luke Cornett and Rob Williams at the time. I'm sorry, Luke Cornett and Taco Fall. And going against the Miami Heat with Bam Adebayo doesn't bode well. Doesn't bode well. So who is there to blame? Is it the players? Is it the coach? Is it the GM? I think there's a little bit of blame to go everywhere. And I'm going to split it up like this. I'm going to give 15% to Brad Stevens because he is the coach. He has to take responsibility to round up the troops and go out and play. He has to be the coach. I put 20%, 20-25, I'll go 25% on the players. Because a lot of times, I mean, no team can win without its players, right? You have to go out there and play. You have to beat the Bulls of the world, the th- uh, the Thunder of the world. You have to go out there and beat the damn uh, Wizards when they were bad. I mean, obviously, now they're taking a resurgence. Russell Westbrook is playing out of his mind, getting a triple-double, like a 20-20-20 every damn night, right? But they're not playing good basketball. They're making dumb mistakes. They're not playing, you know, good Celtics offense. They're not passing the ball. They're not moving. And then the other, what was that, 25, 15, so was that 40? And the other 60% is Danny H because he's the one that constructs the team. He went out the deadline and brought in Mo Wagner, Luke Cornett, and Evan Fournier. Evan Fournier did have COVID, not his fault for missing, you know, an extended period of time. But Luke Cornett and Mo Wagner, come on. 
come on. You you could have gotten Miles Turner, but you didn't pull the trigger because you wanted to win the deal with the Pacers instead of just focusing on improving your team. You traded Daniel Tice away to get under the salary tax. And I I think Evan Fournier was a good trade. It's just hard to, you know, judge that because he was out with COVID. He's playing very well as of late. Past couple games he has been so, but that's still yet to be determined. But Danny Ainge is the one that puts the team together. He could have brought Rajon Rondo back. You could have brought Isaiah Thomas back. He's a leader. You could have brought in Miles Turner. You could have brought in a, a sufficient big man. But nope. We're sitting here on the cusp of playing in the playing game without our second best player, with high expectations, in a conference that we could, we could win. Obviously, the way this season has gone and the way you have performed, that's not happening. And I know I just went on a big-ass Celtics rant, and I kind of said I wouldn't, but I did. I will... I don't know if the mic is picking that up, but Bogey is snoring very loudly and just caught me off guard. <laughs> but I will not you know, forget the fact that Jason Tatum did put up 60 points tying Larry Bird's, excuse me, Celtics record, all-time Celtics record for points scored in a game. That's absolutely awesome. An incredible individual achievement. Something that will be in the record book forever until it is broken. Something that will be never be forgotten. And to put your name up in the same sentence as Larry Bird in whatever it is, absolutely incredible. So, you know, a round of applause to Jason Tatum for that feat. But... But it's an individual achievement, not a team achievement. So yes, have your moment, savor it, remember it, cherish it. But let's move on to the next one because I'm driving. I listen on the radio. People are still talking about it. It's like, guys, it happened a week ago. Put it back in your pants. And can we focus on the Bulls? Can we focus on the Heat? Can we focus on the Knicks? Because those are the games that matter now. All right, I sound very angry right there. You know, let me just, a little chapstick on. Let me just reset myself. Holy smokes. I sound like I was so angry. You know, kind of am. Can you blame me? I haven't been able to do this for a week. I have so much on my mind, so much I need to talk about. Whew. All right. All right, so before I go any further, I do kind of want to pull up the Bruins game because they are live right now. I'm not going to watch because I'll be very distracted by them. It's 2-2. Two to two. Last time I checked, it was 2-1 to one Bruins, so the Islanders tied it up. Not ideal, but with only a couple games left to go in the season. Was it two games, right? Yeah, two games to go in the season. Obviously, this game against the Islanders tonight, and then the game tomorrow against the Capitals in Washington. Bruins cannot, cannot get the number one seed. Obviously, the Penguins have been playing absolutely out of their mind. They're 8-2 and two in their last 10 on a three-game winning streak. I don't think, I think I don't think you can get the second seed, um, because the Capitals have at least 35 wins. If you win the next two, you'll have 34. Although you'll be tied in points or whatever, they still have more wins than you do. So, kiss the number two seed, goodbye. You can still get the number three seed. It's still something that you gotta shoot for and strive for because I don't know. Do you want to play the Penguins in the first round or do you want to play the Capitals in the first round? It's totally up to you guys. But I just think having a third seed. Playing against the Capitals, where I think you have a little bit better of a matchup there with, would be ideally better. You currently have 71 points. Islanders have 70. Islanders have kind of fallen from grace a little bit. They're 4-4-2 four, four, and two in their last 10 games, going from number one all the way down to number four. They've kind of hit you know, a little rock in the road, but you know the game tonight could be absolutely massive because are they going to be done after tonight? The Islanders will be done after tonight, so they could still win tonight, and then you could win tomorrow, and you could still get the third seed, so the power is in your hands if you want that three seed, if you're the Boston Bruins. Do you want three seed? Go out there and win. The playoffs are right around the corner. Literally every single game matters, and losing that game on Saturday to the Rangers 5-4, to four, oh. That was so hurtful. Losing that game 4-3 to three in um, overtime to the Devils on Tuesday. Oh, my God, that hurts. 
that that those are the games those are the points that you need the most right there and i understand the rangers you know kind of a hot team made a late surge for the playoffs but once they were out of it you had to kind of get that game i know you were down like you know four to two and then it was like you know five to three and you kind of made a comeback just fell a little too short but you know what i love the resiliency from that team that game they did not give up at all they played to the final horn and they tried everything they could to absolutely win that game so i do applaud them although they did lose they didn't give up they didn't bow down like you know the boston celtics would have anyways two to two right now bruins and islanders uh six minutes to go in the second period i believe but overall I'm looking forward to playoff hockey. I absolutely love playoff hockey. It is one of the most incredible things out there, whether it's your team or not. It's so fun to watch. It's just even better when your team is in it. Obviously, with the Bruins going to be in it, it's going to be juicy. Juicy. Can we get back to the Stanley Cup that we lost two years ago? Obviously, last year, COVID-riddled season kind of sucked. The way it ended, you know, against the Tampa Bay Lightning wasn't your series. You weren't going to win that. But this team's looking good, man. Six and uh, six, three and one in our last ten. <sighs> this team's looking good, man. This team's really looking good. They have that, you know, motivation. They have that determination. They have the confidence. They have that swagger. Everything you want out of a championship contender, Bruins have it. They're just going to have to compete against the Penguins, the Capitals, and the Islanders in their division. But with everything going on for the Bruins, super happy and impressed that they were fighting for the number one and the number two seed all the way to the end of the season, obviously, until they had a couple hiccups. Penguins have just been straight fire. There's nothing you can do about it. Capitals have kind of turned it on, uh, excuse me, turned it on and ramped it up as well. But to go from being a borderline team out of the playoffs back when the Flyers were still in it all the way up. To the end of the season where you're flirting with one and two. You got number three. You have number three right now. But we'll just have to wait and see. Obviously, the Rangers were kind of on your ass a little bit towards the end of the season. Then you pulled away. Absolutely fantastic season. Love just about everything from this team this year. No matter what happens, I will be looking forward to the playoffs. And this team had a phenomenal 56-game regular season. Moving on to the Red Sox. Man, have they been on fire themselves? Holy smokes. Red Sox. Let me just look them up real quick so I can get the most accurate information. It is one to one in the bottom of the fifth inning. Hey, did anybody see Michael Chavis hit a home run on Friday for his first hit of the season? Getting called up because Kike Hernandez went on the 10 day IL with a strand, uh, strained hamstring, excuse me. Yep, Michael Chavis, first hit of the season, absolute moonshot in Baltimore. Speaking of Baltimore, they are. Back at the bottom of the division again, although they were kind of, you know, close to the top. You know, first couple weeks of the season started off very, very hot. But this is the thing that happens. Baseball, you can start off super hot and get super cold very fast. You can start off super cold and get super hot very fast. I mean, look at the Orioles. They're now 15 and 19, six and a half games out of the division. Yankees, 18 and 16, three and a half games out of the division. Two teams that started, one was hot, one was cold, and now they're flipped it's just baseball, man. And like I said, you have to really look at the first 40 games. And we're not at the first 40 games just yet. A lot of things could still change. But the Red Sox, it's good to see them finally get the respect that they deserve. They are number one in the power rankings. They are the first team to 20 wins um, a couple nights ago. And they're in Baltimore looking for this clean sweep of the Baltimore Orioles, which would be very nice for them as they look ahead to their series against the Oakland Athletics and the Los Angeles Angels next week. Or I guess I should say I guess I should say this week, right? But all in all, I have really nothing to say about the Red Sox because they've just been playing out of their mind. Fantastic baseball. The pitching has been tremendous. It has looked so much better. Garrett Richards, who I kind of you know flamed a couple weeks ago, he's been proving me wrong. He's been looking really good. I have not much to say against uh, against the Red Sox right now. They did lose a couple games against the Rangers and the Tigers that they should have won. I will admit that. That was kind of pretty bad and pretty pathetic. But to kind of flip it around and turn it around, win the last few, um, I'm sorry, win the last game against the Tigers, win the first three games against the Orioles in that series, hopefully potentially sweep. 
you can't complain. Offense has been on fire. You know, they've scored four runs yesterday, which, you know, four runs, it is what it is. 11, 6, 12, 5, 11. They were doing pretty good. They just hit a little lull with Texas and Detroit, but you know what? It happens. It happens, and it's better to happen in the beginning of the season than later in the season because when you have it earlier in the season, you can fix it, you can adjust it so it doesn't happen. When it happens later in the season, it could be too late. That's just baseball. That's just the you know the long, tough grind of the baseball season. That's why you can't really say a team is out. Look at the Washington Nationals a couple years ago. They were like 19 and like 38 or something. End of, April, uh, end of March. No, end of May, excuse me. They go on to win the World Series. It's a long season. Yes, you can kind of afford to lose a couple games here and there, but you can't take too many games for granted, and you can't take too many games off. At the end of the day, like I said, I love what I'm seeing from the Red Sox. Hard to make you know, dis- uh, tough decisions and tough judgments on the entire league until we get to the first 40 games. I think 40 is the marker. Some could say 50, 60, whatever your marker is. That's when you wait for, to make full judgments of the league, whether it's the American or the National League, with the Red Sox being in the American League. At the moment, that's kind of all you care about. But overall, I mean, tough races all the way around. Let's just look at the National League real quick. Mets are in first place. Nationals at the bottom, only three and a half games out. Cardinals in first place. Pirates, you know, only six games out. Giants are in first place. Rockies eight, eight games out. You know, that's not bad. At this point, six weeks into the season, that's not bad. You look at the American League, Red Sox, Orioles are in last place, six and a half games out. Tigers are in last place to the White Sox, 10 games out. And then you have the Athletics in first place to the Angels in last place at four and a half games out. So all the way around, except the American League Central, it's very close and tight, top to bottom. That's what you want to see in baseball. You don't want to see teams get like 50 wins and lose 110 games. That product sucks. That really does. And it was a couple years ago. I think it was like the Tigers, the Orioles, the Royals, and the Rockies or something that like all lost over 105 games or at least 100 games. That's not the stuff you want to see in baseball. That's the stuff that's trash. So I'm, though it's still early, a lot of things still need to fall into place. But right now, in baseball's overall state, I'm not going to complain too much. I'm not. But I'm not going to go any further. I just kind of really wanted to re-enter myself back into the sports world. Back with an episode for you guys on Murph's Boston Sports Talk. Like I said at the top of the show, I appreciate appreciate all of your patience, your concern, your support while I was out with a (coughs) sore throat. I'm so happy to be back behind the mic bringing you Murph's Boston Sports Talk episodes every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. I'm super happy. That I'm back and able to do this. Honestly, thought it was the end of the world with the sore throat. I really did. But then again, whenever you are sick with whatever it is, you always think that, right? You're laying in bed in the middle of the day. It's beautiful outside. And you're just in there coughing up a lung or, you know, popping throat lozenges like it's M&M's. But luckily, I'm back, baby. And I'm back. And I can't wait to see you in the next one. But first, I must say, thank you so much for downloading, listening, and enjoying And also, if you're watching this on YouTube, please like the video if you enjoyed it. Subscribe if you're new to the channel and leave your thoughts down below in the comment section. If you're listening on audio only platforms, reach out to me on social media at Murphs underscore Boston ST, where the ST stands for Sports Talk. Yes, Sports Talk, it does. And thank you so much for joining me. I will catch you in the next one on Hump Day. I mean, Wednesday's edition of Murphs Boston Sports Talk. But until then, I love ya. Now, see ya.